Great. Well, thank you, Sheila. And uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for the seminar again today. Um, as Sheila said, I'll be talking about using linked models to evaluate effects of nutrient and hypoxia reductions on living marine resources. So today we're going to uh, Northern America, and what you're looking at here is the Mississippi River watershed. And every summer, a large uh, area of bottom hypoxia forms along the Louisiana coast. So the state here is Louisiana. And uh, that is mainly fueled by the nutrients that come out of the Mississippi River. So you can see how large of an area, and there's a lot of agriculture here, uh, really feeds uh, that, uh, that river. So you can imagine there's a lot of nutrients coming out here and a hypoxic area is formed in summer every year in the, uh, in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. So it's been uh, long known that this, uh, that this uh, zone forms, uh, but what's not as well known is what the effect of that is on fish and fisheries in the Northern Gulf. So uh, there's uh, species here that are uh, commercially and recreationally important, like red snapper, white shrimp, gulf manatee, and Atlantic croaker. Uh, Atlantic croaker is mainly also very abundant in that area. So I'll be focusing mainly on those uh, uh, nekton species and the effects of the hypoxic zone on these species. So for this project, uh, we wanted to evaluate the effects of hypoxia and nutrient loading on fish and fisheries together and separately, then determine the effects of reductions in nutrient loading and hypoxia, and uh, develop a, a decision support tool that then can be used to look at what the effects are on the different nutrient reduction scenarios on different species in the area. So the reason that uh, looking at nutrient reduction scenarios is relevant because uh, that is the plan of the Mississippi River Gulf of Mexico Watershed Nutrient Task Force, uh, also termed the Hypoxia Task Force. And what they are striving to do is by 2035 to reduce the five-year running average of the Gulf hypoxic zone to 5,000 kilometers square. And if you look at this data here, what this shows is the area of the hypoxic zone throughout the years. And the goal is pretty, pretty low. So we have a little uh, ways to go uh, to get there. So uh, if we were to uh, accomplish that, uh, what is the effect on living resources of those reductions in nutrient loading that is necessary to reach that goal? And first off, we need to know, you know, what amount of nutrient uh, loading reduction is needed. And uh, models have shown that this can be achieved by reducing both nitrogen and phosphorus loading by 45%. So why is this not a very straightforward problem? So this hypoxic zone has been dubbed the dead zone. So it sounds like, you know, pretty terrible and uh, reducing this dead zone can only be good. Um, so the com complexity comes in because uh, this is also an area with very high secondary production has been dubbed at a strikingly rich zone. And this was uh, this term was used in a paper by Nixon and Buckley to um, to really uh, point out that we shouldn't always demonize uh, nutrients. So nitrogen, of course, uh, too much nitrogen causes eutrophication, but it also fuels the food web. Nutrients will uh, uh, support phytoplankton growth, which then subsequently supports zooplankton growth, fish growth, and so on. So if we start reducing these nutrients, we may have um, you know, different effects will reduce hypoxia, which is a good thing also for the hyotrophic level species. But the nutrient reductions to achieve that may reduce secondary production. So what is really the net effect? 
So to figure that out, a ecosystem modeling approach was used that includes effects of hypoxia, but also primary production and the food web interactions that can then reveal uh, what happens if we reduce that primary production. So these were the scenarios run the modeling tool as EcoPath with EcoSim and EcoSpace. We ran a scenario where we kept the nutrient loading intact, so 100% nitrogen and phosphorus representing the status quo. And then uh, we used a 40 and 50% nutrient reduction scenario, so leaving 60 and 50% of nitrogen and phosphorus in. Uh, because that is estimated to encapsulate the reduction necessary to reduce the hypoxic zone to 5,000 kilometers square. And those scenarios were run from 2000 to 2035. So um, all of these uh, simulations were done in eco space, but for any eco space uh, modeling, um, a project you would want to start an ecopath, that mass balance snapshot of the ecosystem. And in this case, it's a food web representing the northern Gulf of Mexico with 66 groups. So this is a very data rich area as well, luckily. Uh, and the biomass inputs are based on CMAP trawl data. So that's a uh, survey going on um, um, uh, every year. And I use data from 2000 to, 2000 to 2005 to build that ecopath model. And I use stock assessments uh, when available. This resulted in these groups. Um, I've underlined species that actually uh, use stock assessment rather than the survey data for their uh, biomass and other inputs. And for all of these uh, groups or species, life stages were included, so uh, multi-stanza. So all of these are connected through trophic interactions. So that would be in the diet matrix where you indicate what those connections are. And uh, there's fishing in the model. So there's fleets as well. We have in this area a extensive shrimp trawl fishery, uh, a menhaden fishery. Recreational fishing is very important. Um, there's a commercial snapper grouper complex fishery. And then there's some smaller other commercial fin fish that I uh, turned into one fleet. Uh, to inform this, uh, there's landings data from NOAA's landings query. Uh, there's a program, MRIP, that records recreational uh, landings. And there's stock assessment data available uh, for those species whose stock is assessed. And then there's discards uh, available from stock assessment as well. All right, so uh, what does that uh, result in, in this ecopath model? I didn't uh, put a lot of work in making this look pretty, uh, but you may all recognize these diagrams. Trophic level is on the y-axis, and mainly what I want to convey here, everything's connected, right? So uh, we have all these gray lines indicating uh, the uh, either the uh, food web interactions, so the, uh, the trophic interactions between species or the fleets uh, fishing on these different species. So with that, uh, we can go into EcoSim uh, to calibrate the model. So that's the temporal dynamic simulations of the modeling. Um, because we're mainly interested in how these changes in the environment, the nutrient reduction scenarios affect uh, these uh, species, the environmental drivers are important. So you already include those in EcoSim. Uh, for that, uh, we used uh, output from a coupled physical biological model that can be that, that did those uh, hypoxia scenarios. Uh, the output that we could use as environmental drivers from that was phytoplankton, salinity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. And um, that, in combination with uh, response curves, then in the model determines the effect of these environmental drivers on the species. And I've used sigmoidal curves for dissolved oxygen and trapezoidal curves for salinity and temperature. 
So what is really the tolerance of these species for the environmental drivers? Luckily, during these extensive surveys done in the areas, also um, temperature and salinity and dissolved oxygen is measured. So that combination of catch and these uh, water quality measurements were used to create these um, uh, response curves. So the response curves are slightly different for each of the species, which is really important to uh, uh, to get at, you know, what is, you know, when you have a nutrient reduction scenario or a hypoxia reduction in the area, how much does that affect any of these particular groups in the model? So this is all done through the habitat capacity model in uh, the software, uh, where you include this environmental preference function with a particular response curve shape and uh, whatever that value is of say your um, dissolved oxygen will then determine the capacity on a scale of zero to one. Uh, to forage in that area. And that uh, capacity also affects, uh, affects movements uh, from one cell to the other. So that's kind of the relative capacity of the cell the species is in and the cell that surrounds, or the, the cells that, around, that surround that cell that determine how fast or slow the species is moving over the uh, model area. For calibration, there were 61 time series included uh, over a calibration period of 2000 to 2016. Uh, these were biomass, catches, and fishing mortality time series. So here is some of that output from the species um, that we were mostly interested in. So here are some uh, calibration outputs of biomass. So those are the sums of squares of the deviation in uh, brackets here. Um, so uh, pretty good fits overall. And then we calibrated catch as well uh, for those groups uh, that had a fishery on them. And that also uh, ended up working pretty well. So with a calibrated model, we now move into EcoSpace, which is a spatial temporal uh, modeling component. Uh, this is run in IBM mode. That's the individual based model. The advantage of that, specifically if you use um, environmental drivers in your model, is that um, it really calculates um, your, uh, your mortality and how well species are doing in a specific area in the cells that the uh, species are in and not an average of your entire model area. So for especially for these applications where you're uh, looking at maybe a stressor in your environment that is localized, uh, it is best to run your model in individual-based uh, mode. Uh, this is the model domain. Um, so there's uh, five kilometer square uh, grid cells in the model. What you see here in yellow is you, Louisiana. The orange is an exclusion layer. That's uh, super handy to use when you couple a model to a different model that already has a model domain so that you can match the model domain and make sure that each of your model cells receive uh, input, uh, so the environmental driver input from your coupled model. So this is output from that coupled model. This is a ROMS model. What you see depicted here, first off is time. We're gonna run through one year. What you see at the top is the chlorophyll uh, that's changing through time. So that in, indicates you know, the amount of phytoplankton that is in the system. And then the dissolved oxygen at the bottom of that model area. And what you can see when we go into summer is that uh, there's more chlorophyll here at the top. 
those phytoplankton are going to sink and die and bacterial decomposition is going to take out the oxygen at the bottom, which are these red areas that you see here. So we really have this summer hypoxia occurring in this area and then it dissipates again in fall when there's uh, mixing and the dissolved oxygen really gets mixed into the uh, water column again. And that pretty much repeats every year. Uh, it really depends uh, per year what the uh, severity and size of the hypoxic zone is, uh, but it's an annual uh, summer phenomenon. So feeding this into ecospace, uh, what does that result in? Uh, what you're looking at here, it's pixelated because this is our individual based uh, model is um, uh, uh, one year where hypoxia is pretty severe, 2008. And what I'm showing is a sequence of all the months. And the, uh, the color here is white shrimp biomass. What you see here is the edge of the shell. So this species is a species that lives on the bottom and, um, and, and really occurs on the shelf. So when we go through the months here, it's doing good in spring. And then when summer starts occurring, you really see white shrimp clearing out of this area where that, uh, that hypoxic zone occurs and then reoccurring again uh, in fall and, uh, and in winter. So uh, we really see this happening, right? If we look at the distribution of these species, uh, that the species are affected by the hypoxic zone. So if we look at biomass through time, so here are the model years. After 16 years, I start the different scenarios. Uh, so this can be regarded as the spin-up period where all three nutrient scenarios are at 100% nutrients. Then the baseline continues in red, but we have a 40% reduction in nitrogen and phosphorus in, in uh, light blue and a 50% reduction in nitrogen and phosphorus in dark blue. Um, so looking at these results, we don't see that much of an effect, right, on the biomass of white shrimp. So is just a model maybe not so responsive? So in the modeling world, you know, we can do what we want. So I ended up uh, just looking at reducing the hypoxia and not the nutrients. And then we see biomass of white shrimp increasing. So it is affected by hypoxia but there is a positive effect of, of hypoxia reductions, but a negative effect on biomass of nutrient reductions. And it kind of evens out. So we see a very small net effect that changes, that's a little bit different per species and a little bit different uh, per year. So let's go through some of these species that I indicated are important in this area. Here we have Gulf Menhaden, for example. So here you do see a slight improvement in biomass of Menhaden when um, the, uh, the nutrient reduction scenarios are run. And, uh, and again, that is indeed more if we just uh, reduce the amount of hypoxia that this species is um, experiencing. And we kind of see that uh, throughout the species in the model. So the slight differences that you see, for example, here with Atlantic croaker, which is known to not be very sensitive to low oxygen, that the nutrient reduction scenarios actually already uh, result in a, uh, a reduced uh, biomass of, of Atlantic croaker. So in this specific example, uh, the net effect um, is slightly negative. So the nutrient reductions that reduce the secondary production has a stronger effect on um, Atlantic croaker than that the uh, uh, hypoxia really, uh, the reductions in hypoxia really improves that biomass. But again, the difference is, is pretty small. And, and just to test again, it does actually improve when we reduce hypoxia and not change the amount of nutrients that this area uh, receives. So there is an effect again of hypoxia reductions here too, but a net effect really reduce, uh, reduces biomass. 
Red Snap are another one where people are very interested here. What you can see here is that it really depends per year. Like I said, the size of the hypoxic zone or the severity of hypoxia really varies per year. Uh, so you can imagine that in some years, reducing hypoxia by 40 or 50 or reducing nutrients by 40 or 50 percent uh, ends up being a net positive effect. And in other years, it may be a net negative effect, depending on how much it affected by, uh, by hypoxia. And, uh, and always slightly positive when we just reduce hypoxia. All right, so uh, we uh, one thing I wanted to point out is that uh, we did run uh, Monte Carlo in EcoSpace uh, to look at how um, uh, how variable really that output is if we run it through time. Um, so what you can see, um, and, and the main thing actually that I want to point out is a lot of these species that where there's a lot of interest in, we also have more information for. So what you see here, for example, that red snapper, there's not a whole lot of variation around the output when we run Monte Carlo. So that's a pretty robust model. While others say Spanish mackerel that's above a red snapper here or red drum uh, to the, um, uh, to the right here, where we know a little bit less about, or the uh, spotted sea trout, there's a little bit more variability. So, uh, so it's it's good news. I would say that a species that uh, that people are really interested in to learn uh, how they are affected, we have uh, pretty high confidence in the output. So we see red snapper here, Atlantic croaker here, Gulf menhaden here. Uh, brown shrimp, white shrimp, uh, really all uh, either very abundant, so ecologically important or commercially important or recreationally important. And I added phytoplankton here as well. So it's important for phytoplankton to be pretty robust as well, because that is really driving uh, what the net effect and ends up being. And, and, uh, and we are pretty confident in our phytoplankton runs as well. So with that information, uh, you can look at the uncertainty of your output. We haven't truly uh, fully analyzed this output yet, but these uh, probability density plots can already show you that if we run, for example, the scenario that is most different from the base run, so that 50% nitrogen and phosphorus reduction, and we go to the last year of the, of the run in 2035, we have um, you know, pretty nice dome-shaped probability density plot. So the, the probability of your output um, uh, being that of a mean base run and, the, and kind of a distribution from that is shown with these plots. And uh, you know, we have one nice peak and it's not really, you know, it, uh, it, and, and it's pretty well a pretty well-defined peak. Which, which makes us again pretty confident about these outputs. So in conclusion, hypoxia affects species distribution. So I do wanna point out that first, those maps that I showed, uh, which even when the net effect is not that large, right, can have uh, effects on 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 the on the fishery on its species, for example. So um, there can be indirect effects on distribution changes. So. Um, uh, fishes need to move further away from their feeding grounds. Fleets need to move further away, perhaps from the coast, if they need to pass through that hypoxic zone first. Uh, so there's definitely consequences to a change in distribution, uh, even when the net effect ends up being uh, uh, not that big of a change in total biomass. So, so that is important output as well. And again, that distribution is more strongly affected than the total biomass of most of these fisheries uh, species. So really um, 
uh, for management purpose, perhaps looking into the distribution uh, is uh, and and how uh, chain or hypoxia itself, but also reducing that hypoxia may affect uh, really how uh, accessible some of these species are to to fishing fleets. Uh, what we've seen is that the nutrient reductions that are needed to reduce the hypoxia reduces that bottom-up energy flow into the food web, so it reduces secondary production. But the associated hypoxia reductions with those nutrient reductions do have positive effects on these fishery species and really most of the groups in the food web. So some of those, pat so those patterns that I showed were really pervasive uh, throughout the food web. The net effect on the biomass of living marine resources is if generally very small. It is species specific and it varies uh, by year. So, um, so, so by providing this output to managers, uh, another useful aspect could be to look at um, years with a large hypoxic zone or with a small hypoxic zone and, and uh, and what effect do nutrient reductions have on these different uh, situations and then on the distribution and biomass of species of interest. So in order to make this easy to kind of look at these different scenarios, uh, we've created a, a decision support tool. It's really a visualization tool. So uh, the output is of this support tool is predetermined. We loaded a bunch of uh, output scenarios in that tool. But then um, anybody interested, and right now uh, the, the group most interested in this output is the Hypoxia Task Force, uh, and they have the link to this tool, uh, is to look at different nutrient reduction scenarios, and you can pick different species and look at what the effect or the estimated effect is on, on the species if we, if we were to do uh, such a scenario. So really the goal of that decision support tool is to, to provide these users with the estimates of change in biomass and distribution in response. And, and we had to select you know, interesting scenarios as well. So we really se selected the goals of the hypoxia task force so that they would be most interested in that output. Uh, so those are the proposed reductions in nitrogen and phosphorus um, to reduce the size of the hypoxic zone in the Arctic Gulf of Mexico to 5,000 kilometers squares. Um, and we also focused on that, uh, what you may have seen, there was an interim goal listed as well um, of a 20% reduction in nitrogen and phosphorus by 2025. Uh, so we've included the output of those um, scenario runs uh, as well. And, and again, as well as what I just showed in, that present, in this presentation, um, the uh, scenarios of um, a 50 and 40% nitrogen and phosphorus uh, uh, load reduction. So this is what that uh, tool looks like. So it, it's uh, it's linked to my website, uh, but it's it's really on uh, an ArcGIS dashboard, dashboard with its own web address. Um, so here you see um, the reduction you can choose, um, which um, uh, and 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 there's maps of what the phytoplankton uh, looks like then, and what the dissolved oxygen looks like then then um, those same reductions, which would be useful, you could choose a different one as well, on the species biomass that will be shown in these two maps. So uh, what we chose to do here is always show a map of no nutrient load reductions so that the difference can be seen between what uh, the distribution would look like if we do not reduce uh, the nutrients and what the distribution would look like under a specific chosen reduction. And then you can choose the month here and there's a little uh, menu here as well where you can go to different species and then find an instructional video of this, of this tool. Uh, we have uh, outputting graphs of the uh, uh, the, the change in time as well, so of the phytoplankton, dissolved oxygen, and species biomass. So this uh, will get you actually to the tool. So if you're interested, you can take a picture of this QR code and you'll get to the tool. 
I'm just going to click on this link uh, right here. So you can see it's an ArcGIS dashboard. And really what the image I just showed is a screenshot of this dashboard. So if you go to that, the maps will load here. And these are these pull down menus that I just talked about. We were surprisingly limited in what we could load because we actually have a lot of output and a lot of different nutrient reduction scenarios. Um, but it didn't fit all in the ArcGIS dashboard. Uh, so we really chose uh, those scenarios of most interest and those species of most interest. All right, and with that, I would like to thank my uh, collaborators uh, that have all helped me a lot in this work and uh, my funders. Uh, so that's uh, funding from NOAA that, that supported this work. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, great talk. It was <laughs> it was really quite interesting and it, it's great to see that you know, you're actually doing some of the things that hopefully we'll be able to do in some other projects sometime soon. So the panelists are, are getting there. Um, and I see we have one question <clears throat> in the Q&A. So I'll start with those while everybody else thinks up their questions. Uh, David Richards says, uh, is, the mo is the zone more eutrophic or hyper eutrophic? Is it possibly nutrient limited? Um, will adding more nutrients or improving uh, improve or alter the food web or species is a species specific um will it increase some biomass of some species um and not others right so uh we actually did not run nutrient increase scenarios which actually would be really interesting because <laughs> uh you know, we started this in 2016 and 2025 is coming really close with, with that interim goal of a 20% reduction in nitrogen and phosphorus. And I can tell you, we're not reaching that. So uh, these are interesting scenarios to look at. Uh, but I think indeed the next interesting thing is to look at nutrient increase scenarios. Right now, that may still be the direction that we're going. Um, I would say, of course, we all, in theory, know there's definitely something as too much nutrients, right? There is hypereutrophication, and it will really uh, um, hurt the uh, living resources in that area if we're if we're in that situation. So, to really realize when we're there, and and indeed for which species uh, we we get there, we may get there sooner for some species than others. I would say nutrient increase scenarios would need to be run uh, to really get at that, um, uh, get at that information. Uh, I would not say it is hyper eutrophic yet. It's really a thriving area, a nutrient rich area with a lot of uh, productivity. Um, but other than the hypoxic zone, so really that, that lower bottom area, uh, where we do see negative effect, especially on benthic species that cannot move, for example. Uh, this is really a, an area that is not really hurting by the nutrient, the input of nutrients yet. So scenarios that increase nutrients would really get at the answer uh, to that question and really figure out, you know, how much is too much. Maybe we are really close. We just don't know it yet. Um, but so far, I think at least um, uh, I my output hasn't really provided, I would say, the ammunition for the hypoxia task force to really show how important it is. Uh, to reduce the nutrients in the watershed, because that's really where the fight is, right? In that large watershed that I showed in the beginning, that's where the nutrients uh, reductions need to occur. Um, so, I mean, the fishes in the Northern Gulf of Mexico are not truly, you know, negatively affected by this nutrient input. But at least I think these results show 
that they can withstand these nutrient reductions all the way to 50% and still uh, pretty much uh, do the same as they're doing right now. So it can also not be used the other way around where people are like, oh, we shouldn't be reducing any of those nutrients because we'll lose the fisheries revenue. I think we are losing some fisheries revenue, which we should be able to, with some more work, even use this output to figure out as well. Uh, the shrimp fishers, they are used to moving around like, oh, you cannot fish here this time of year. Let's go over here. So really kind of that um, lost opportunity. So that opportunity cost, uh, we should be able to to figure that out. Uh, and it's and it's and it is known. We can see. Uh, that the you know the boats are kind of aggregating on the edges of the hypoxic zone, so there is a response to it. But they're so used to it, uh, people are not truly thinking of you know what are we, what can we gain if this wasn't there, this hypoxic zone. So there may definitely still be something to gain. I see Carl's hand up. Carl is a. Uh sitting there very excited. <laughs> <Where> Carl? <laughs> <laughs> Carl's actually excited right now because a message just came from my little sister that she got COVID, which is real scary. <laughs> anyway, yeah, two questions for you, Kim. First one, uh, how much do you trust that ROMS model? And the reason I ask is that I've tried to develop leak models to predict uh, low oxygen areas in a couple of the Florida Bay situations and so on. I found those models really, really difficult to calibrate. So the question is, have they really run the ROMS, ROMS model for different inflows years to make sure that it actually does correctly predict the size of the hypoxic area? Right. So you'll maybe answer that first and then I'll ask you a second one. Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. And I should have put some of their calibration results on there as well. Uh, I would say this is probably the best model we have of this area, and they've calibrated it from 2000 to 2016, which does include a lot of uh, a variation in the size of the hypoxic zone, so uh, uh, very low hypoxic years or large hypoxic zone years, and uh, this model is doing very well. This is a group from Dalhousie University, and there are several groups working on this. Uh, uh, I think they, they've won uh, kind of <laughs> the race. So, so everybody believes their scenarios for how the hypoxic film area is. That's not going to be questioned in your results. Okay, yeah. and the other one is that if I, yeah. was, uh, if I was a manager in the area and so on, or anybody even looking at, at the efficient back predict, one of the first questions I'd ask you is, has anybody done simpler kind of statistical modeling to look at whether there is an empirical relationship between fish production in any of those fish species and the hypoxic area? Because I remember trying to do that back when with some of the uh, that uh, survey data from the area, and I couldn't find any good correlations at all. Right. Uh, yeah. Somebody taken that kind of more direct, it's like in a stock assessment model, what we would do is, Fit the stock assessment model with production or recruitment anomalies linked to the hypoxic area data. Has anybody done that? Yeah, there's a study uh, done with shrimp that looked at that, and there was a relationship. But um, I agree, which is almost you know one of the reasons to start this modeling exercise. Uh, there, there are not a lot, it's not a very clear relationship and there are not a lot of studies out there. So the study that showed that strong relationship is actually pretty old and I'm not sure how much it has been uh, repeated uh, since then. So, um, I mean, to me, it seems like this is where, uh, you know, the answer lies in that uh, uh, the kind of the opposing effects of hypoxia and, and nutrient loading, and we may indeed oh. not see this very strong relationship. But the other thing that I just mentioned as well is that this has been going on for so long that I think the shrimp fishers are seeing a loss that it is just not quantified yet because it's not like they've, uh, it's a, this new thing, they've always just gone and fished somewhere else. So 
they don't come back empty handed, but sometimes they go to Texas, right? So, but, but they're, they're already screwed to start with because of price drops, because of competition. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's really hard to separate those yeah. effects. Right now, I would say, and, and that also doesn't make hypoxia a main issue for fishers in the area. It is the imported shrimp from China <laughs> that yeah. is the, the problem yeah. for shrimp fishers in this area. So, um, and I would say, uh, the Menhaden fishery is still so abundant and so inshore, it almost occurs before uh, the hypoxic zone. Uh, so they don't have to travel further because of hypoxia, because they're almost more inland from it. But I think the shrimp fleet is actually moving because of hypoxia. But it is indeed not their biggest issue right now. Uh, so one more real quick question. That is, it's, this is brilliant work. The, the really brilliant thing here was recognizing you needed to use the IBM mode for EcoSpace. How did you realize that? What made you think to do that? Because nobody else has. <laughs> uh, let me think. I think um, just uh, talking with, uh, with Joe and with Dave and what does the IBM mode really do? Uh, we were writing this EcoSpace chapter, uh, right? Uh, so, uh, so we submitted another version that's probably final last Friday. Um, and, and really looking into what does what, right, in, in, in EcoSpace. And, um, and, and yeah, I think just realizing that uh, it doesn't make sense, especially if you look at a localized environmental issue, that those parameters are basically kind of averaged out. Um, you should indeed use I IBM modes to look at, at a problem like this. So uh, yeah, I guess just looking into it a bit more and, and realize you know, what the problem at hand is and, and that specifically for this issue, this is just the way to go. Yeah, I, I developed an IBM mode for exactly the reasons you okay. bring it up. Yeah. yeah that, that's why I put that in there. Excellent, Didn't yeah. Anybody would ever use it. Anyway, <laughs> great job. Right. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I had the multi stanzas in there. So I think for people that are not using it, uh, one thing to realize is you do want to have those life stages in your model uh, for it to work. Uh, those were already in there, so it was an easy, easy next step. And and yeah, so that output, the, the distribution I showed, especially that, especially the distribution really changed when I started using IBM mode versus uh, the normal multi-stanza mode. So, um, so yeah, okay, thanks, thanks for creating that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kim, there's a, another question from David um, asking, uh, going back to the sort of models again, are there other models that predict phytoplankton assemblage changes due to nutri nutrient changes? I mean, um, not other ecopath models, but other yeah, absolutely. So first off, let me ask you a question. When you say assemblage, do you mean uh, different species of phytoplankton, whether that's model, or do you just mean whether phytoplankton is, is changes uh, due to nutrient changes as models? I'll allow him to speak so he can actually... Different species yeah. and biomass, yeah. Um, so... Uh, for example, that ROMS model, actually one of the outputs is phytoplankton. So they are modeling the effect of the nutrient changes on phytoplankton. And to me, um, that was actually uh, the better model to, to, to look at the phytoplankton than, uh, rather than using uh, Ecopath for that. Um, because we really use it uh, as a driver. You can grab nitrogen, right? Uh, you can use it as a driver, but we all know that it's not, there's no like linear relationship always per se between phytoplankton and nitrogen. So you would actually want to use a different model that really looks at the combination of nitrogen and phosphorus and maybe light and, you know, really this lower trophic level biological model then get the phytoplankton from that and then use that to drive. So you can still use it as a driver, like a nutrient. So we use our 
phytoplankton biomass from the ecopath model, but the changes in that phytoplankton biomass are driven by the phytoplankton from the ROMS model. Uh, they have the, the ability to look at different species. Uh, really how it works is they look at size classes. So it depends a little bit on who you work with, whether they do that. Uh, right now in these runs, um, I only used one phytoplankton group. I think an improvement would be to look at more groups. So here, for example, uh, there could be a different phytoplankton species response to a lot of nutrient loading and less nutrient loading. So botanists have pointed this out to me. So uh, my next project, we actually are going to use two phytoplankton groups where one is just, uh, and it's this is a little bit more inshore, is more uh, a group of cyanobacteria that are not really, uh, uh, you know, serving as the base of that food web as much as the other groups of phytoplankton. So to be able to make that distinction and how they respond, and, and I would say how the relative uh, biomass of those different species respond to nutrient loading or reductions in nutrient loading, I think would add uh to this model um so, so that's... include diatoms because diatoms are actually pop up with high nutrient loading conditions and they're actually poisonous to some zooplankters yeah the negative on... cor correlation in the ocean between diatoms and zooplankton yeah so in other projects you know there's harmful algal blooms so what when would that be triggered so if you have other people that can really figure that out and then use that as input. We can do a lot with that in ecopath and ecosim and ecospace, uh, but to get at that, like which phytoplankton would you see and, and what, uh, you know, how, um, uh, how are they uh, connected to the food web and maybe not so much or maybe negatively, I think that would improve these type of models. And that's definitely uh, next uh, on the list. Yeah, and that's often the case where you don't really have really good diet data to be able to figure out, you know, they just talk about phytoplankton and they don't necessarily give you good links of, of you know, types of different... Phytoplankton. Yeah, I think in a way, though, you can go in the direction of what Carl was saying, some some species of al algae are harmful. So as, if, as long as you know that, you can then include that effect in there as well and not just... Uh, Oftentimes what we find is, you know, oh, more phytoplankton. Oh, great, <laughs> more yeah. food. So to be better at that, I think, uh, you know, have, making sure to, to collaborate, because this is not something we do with our higher trophic level models, right? To collaborate with somebody that can figure out yeah. the nutrient loading and changes in that, how that changes your phytoplankton assemblages is really the way to go. And then we can work with that information into ECOPATH and what would it do to our food web. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to, oh, Kiara, quickly, I was going to just ask, and then, then you can have the, the I was going to ask about the, um, the tool that you created. I mean, is it, do you think it'll be used a lot? And is it, do you think there's, a different way to ArcGIS to use something else that yeah. be better? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything would be better, <laughs> in my opinion, to ArcGIS, but that's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, um, I bet uh, other ways would be a lot easier. <laughs> Uh, we were surprised by uh, kind of how clunky it was or even how how little data we can load into this because we thought, well, at least the advantages is this huge, um, you know, uh, ArcGIS system. We've got user support. Uh, we've got a website. We can load all these things up. We had a whole matrix of nutrient reduction scenarios of nitrogen and phosphorus, like, 80% this, 20% yeah. that, and and we were just very limited in what we could put in there. Um, I I have in the past created an R Shiny app. I think that has now developed so much uh, through time that that has probably surpassed what you can do with ArcGIS dashboards. Um, but it was it wasn't a super positive experience, uh, I would say. So we ended up, um, you know, finishing it uh, with it. 
I do think it will be used a lot by the hypoxia task force. So with a lot of the, um, we did a lot of meetings with um, stakeholders and, and really to look into who's interested and who would use this. And that helped, especially when we realized we can't put everything and everything in there to really focus on the things they were interested in and they are going to be the ones uh, to use it. So, um, so yeah, I think it's useful in the end and I'll probably go a different route next time. <laughs> Thanks, Kiara. And then I see one of our participants, Greg, is also um, waiting to ask. Uh, Greg, I've, I've, I've given you the, the chance to speak, so, but Kiara can go first. Uh, just a curiosity, and probably I missed it, uh, but uh, you know that at the Commission we do something similar in terms of reduction of nutrients for policy, uh, using biogeochemical model coupled with the AWE. Uh, but now we are in a phase that we treat the nutrients not at the same level of percentage reduction. We actually do combination of nutrients. What if we reduce, I don't know, 20% of nitrogen and 50% of uh, phosphorus and, and so on. I wonder if you did some, or are you going to plan Maybe you did it or said it already and I missed it, but I wonder if you did it. Yeah, we did. Uh, but yeah, I didn't present the results of that and they are not in the dashboard uh, because uh, we just didn't have the room. But yeah, there's uh, a matrix of combinations and we run. Uh, we ran a few, I have to think of which ones, but we really ended up focusing on the uh, the goals of the hypoxia task force in the end, and that's what the paper is going to do as well. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, the, we have we have some outputs um, uh, on that as well, and there's definitely, you know, the, it, and for us it's two nutrients, so nitrogen and phosphorus, and, and in different uh, reductions. Thanks. Uh, no, I, I love this work. And I think that if you add the cost income structure of the different fishing fleets, you will definitely see a change in the profit if you have some price data. And I'm sure NOAA does. So in, in, in a new iteration of this, you could really get into the trade-offs between uh, what would happen to the fruit shrimp fishers. And I also like this a lot in the sense that it doesn't give you a, an answer yet to what we should do in the future. So really cool. But have you tried looking at, at, at how sensitive uh, some of your results are to, because uh, I'm thinking that not every place that we will be seeing this kind of work is a super data rich environment like, like, like your area. So how sensitive are some of your outputs to like, let's say a different environmental response curve for oxygen uh, or, or maybe, I don't know, temperature, you've used the trapezoids, right? So have you tried looking at that? Uh, not in this project, but I know what you're talking about. Like you can, if we don't know necessarily the shape of the curve, we've done in other projects, some runs with like, well, what if the curve is different? So, so I can't answer that for this question, uh, for this project, because um, I didn't really test different shapes of curves. Uh, we did look at, so with that with Monte Carlo runs, we did see a difference in uh, species we didn't have as much data for as others that we could actually see that the kind of that spread of if you change a little bit of the input, uh, how much does the output change and and uh, it was larger for species that we knew less about. So it was pretty uh, obvious that like, well, we are going to do a little better if we know a little bit more. And luckily it all comes together, like the species that people really not want to know stuff about, we also have stock assessment for, we also know more about. So I guess we kind of luck out in, in that area. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting exercise to look at um, uh, different shapes of curves. Uh, I would say throughout the development of this project, there has been some changes in the curves, uh, but I don't have you know, readily available output of what really was the sensitivity of those changes. It was more, I guess, improvements over time, um, what these curves look like. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting way to, or even look into, we don't know the shape of the curve. You can maybe even use it what best fit the data, right? So so you could use your curves and change your curves in that way. And, and, uh, and we've done that for different projects. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions from any of the attendees that are still around there or any from, from 
the people. I think uh, Kiara had to leave, unfortunately, but uh, yeah. And I see that my computer is still preparing to live stream. So I'm assuming live stream didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I just have to give up trying. Um, yeah, so indeed, uh, really I see great. a recording and I see live on yeah, my screen. Yeah. Maybe it will generate at the end, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's live on YouTube, but... Uh... Uh, yeah, I think anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's it's fine. <laughs> I I have recorded it, so I it will go onto the YouTube. Uh, I'll get your room to to put it on the EcoPath YouTube channel anyway, which is really the most important place for it to be. So it'll be fine. So, um, yeah, I don't know if there's any other comments, questions, any last. <laughs> go for it, Carl. This is Jim. Jim. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How's Jim doing? He doesn't respond to emails. He passed away. Oh. Jesus, I thought I feared to answer that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, I'll get in touch with you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, okay. If there is no other questions uh, or comments, uh, great. Uh, really great talk, Kim. I'm really glad that we had quite a lot of people listening because the last time we tried this it didn't work so well. So wonderful. And thank you very much, everybody, for, for being here. And as I said, uh, the next uh, presentation, the next webinar will be on the 5th of April, which is a Wednesday.